On July 15th, deep in the forests of Olympic National Park, near Cunolt, Washington, a Murphy Moose experimental airplane went down. One passenger didn't make it, two others survived, and now the NTSB has released their preliminary findings. And let me tell you, this one has some really crazy elements. We've got a home-built bush plane, a turbine engine swap, a complete loss of power in flight, and a crash into some of the densest terrain in the Pacific Northwest. So let's break down what happened to what we know so far and what we can actually learn from this accident. Now, first off, let's talk about the airplane itself, because this isn't your typical Cessna or Piper. This was a Murphy Moose SR-3500, a big, Canadian-designed kit plane that's popular with folks who love backcountry flying. Normally, you'd see these things built with big piston engines, sometimes even the old Russian Vedenayev M14P radial. That's how this one started out when it was originally built in Canada. But here's where it gets interesting. After being imported into the U.S. in 2023, this moose was heavily modified. The builder ripped out that radial and installed a Pratt and Whitney PT6A20 turboprop. If you're not familiar, the PT6 is kind of a legend in aviation. It's known for being bulletproof reliable, used in King Airs, caravans, and a whole bunch of serious utility aircraft, but putting one of these engines in a home-built kit plane? That's not exactly standard, and it's definitely not simple. You're talking about major firewall forward modifications, different weight and balance considerations, fuel system changes, the works. The pilot had only purchased the airplane in late 2024, so we're not talking about decades of ownership here. It was registered to a company called Rad Holding ILLC out of Wyoming. And honestly, this setup represents what a lot of experimental builders love, pushing performance boundaries. But the flip side is, when you're flying something with that many custom modifications, you're also carrying more unknowns. That's the trade-off in the experimental world. So let's move to the day of the crash. It was actually a beautiful day. Clear skies, 10 miles visibility, warm summer temps. The pilot took off from Olympia, Washington, flew up to Secu on the coast for lunch with his passengers, and then departed back toward Olympia in the afternoon. Nothing unusual so far. But about 20 minutes into that return leg, things started to unravel. According to the pilot, the engine suddenly changed its sound and began making what he described as a weird vibration. That alone would get any pilot's stomach to drop. Then the master caution light illuminated, and just like that, the turboprop lost all power. A complete failure. Now, in that situation, the pilot considered gliding toward a nearby lake as a possible emergency landing site, but he quickly realized he wasn't going to make it. Instead, he extended the flaps to slow the airplane down and set up for a forced landing in the trees. That's a brutal decision no pilot wants to make. You're basically picking which part of the forest you're going to plow into. And here's where we can pause for a quick analysis. Not to criticize, but to learn. When you lose an engine, every knot of airspeed and every foot of altitude becomes your lifeline. Extending flaps early can bleed off precious glide distance. Was that the right call? Hard to say in the moment. He may have been trying to make sure the touchdown was survivable for his passengers, but the real point here is that forced landings are a no-win scenario. You're trying to minimize the damage, not avoid it completely. And in remote mountainous terrain like Olympic National Park, your options shrink to almost nothing. When the engine quit and the pilot realized he couldn't stretch the glide to that lake, his only option was trees. The moose hit steep, heavily forested terrain near the Eyerly Lake Trailhead at Lake Kinau. If you pull this area up on a map, you'll see what I mean. Solid forest canopy, broken hillsides, almost no flat spots for miles. Forcing an airplane down here is basically controlled destruction. On impact, the pilot was knocked unconscious. When he came to, hours later by his account, he had to face the aftermath. One passenger was fatally injured. The other was badly hurt, but alive. Somehow, through shock and injuries, the pilot managed to pull his passengers clear of the wreck and then manually switch on 
the aircraft's emergency locator transmitter. That step is a big deal. Modern 406 MHz ELT connect into the COSPAS SARSAT satellite network and immediately push a distress signal with GPS coordinates. Compare that to the old 121.5 MHz beacons, which just squeal into space and might take hours or days to triangulate. The ELT activation is what alerted search and rescue crews that there was a downed aircraft in Olympic National Park. From there, the clock started. At about 6.40 p.m., Olympic dispatch was notified. Roughly half an hour later, at 7.15, a Navy helicopter launched from Nass Whidbey Island. Even with all of that speed and technology, it wasn't until after 10 p.m., long after night had fallen, that the survivors were finally hoisted out by long line. Imagine lying injured in the forest for five or six hours, listening to rescue helicopters circling, not knowing if they'll even find you. That's the reality of backcountry aviation accidents. Now, thankfully, there was no post-crash fire. That gave everyone a fighting chance to survive. But the loss of one passenger is a brutal reminder that even if you survive the landing, injuries and environment can tip the balance the wrong way. The real learning point here is that survival isn't just about the landing itself, it's about the hours afterward. Having the right equipment, like a modern beacon, or even a sat communicator, can literally be the difference between life and death when you're flying in remote terrain like this. All right, let's step back for a second and talk about the bigger lessons here, because accidents like this are exactly why the NTSB publishes even preliminary reports to start the learning process early. The first lesson is about experimental and amateur built airplanes. They're an amazing part of aviation. You can build a Murphy Moose in your garage, put a massive radial on it, or even bolt on a turbine like this one. That's freedom. But the FAA and NTSB numbers don't lie. EAB have a higher accident rate compared to factory built aircraft like a Cessna 182 or a Piper Cherokee. Not catastrophically higher, but enough to matter. The extra risk usually comes down to variation. Every one of these planes is unique. Different builder skills, different modifications, different flight test histories. So when you strap into one, you're not flying a certified design with decades of standardized testing. You're flying a one-off. That doesn't make them unsafe, but it means pilots need to be extremely diligent about maintenance, checkouts, and knowing their airplane's quirks. Second, let's talk about the engine. The PT-6 is a legend, no question about it. Operators love to brag that it never quits, but in reality, every mechanical system has limits. The PT-6 has its own history of failures, fuel control unit malfunctions, hot section turbine blade problems, gearbox issues. They're rare, but they happen. And in this case, because the engine wasn't installed by Pratt & Whitney or Cessna or Beechcraft engineers, but instead adapted into a kit plane, we have another variable. Integration work and conversions can introduce unexpected weak spots, fuel delivery, cooling, even simple wiring. None of this is confirmed in this crash, but it's worth pointing out because it highlights the trade-offs of high-performance modifications. And then there's survivability. This part is really tough to think about, but it's important. If you're flying over terrain like the Olympics, you have to assume there may not be a usable landing spot. It's not like flying over Kansas or Texas where you can usually find a field. Out there, your field is 150 foot tall trees. That's why bush pilots preach preparation, brief your passengers, tell them what to do if you go down, carry survival gear, have a personal locator beacon or a Garmin inReach clipped to your belt, because the one thing that keeps showing up in survival stories isn't luck, it's preparation. And now, the most important part of all, what we still don't know. This is where we need to pump the brakes a little. Because yes, we have facts from the preliminary, but the NTSB hasn't told us why this airplane lost power. And honestly, it could be months, even over a year, before we see a final probable cause. Right now, the big unanswered questions look something like this. Was this a pure mechanical failure inside the PT-6? something that just gave out? Was it related to the installation of the turbine in an airframe 
that wasn't originally designed for it? Could it have been a fuel issue, like contamination, mismanagement, or a system problem, or even something maintenance-related? At this point, it's all just questions. What we do know is the human side. One passenger didn't survive. Another is seriously injured. The pilot walked away with minor injuries, but is going to carry this forever. As of now, authorities haven't released their identities, and out of respect for the families, that's where we'll leave it. And this is where I want to make one thing really clear. Accidents are almost never about a single mistake. They're about chains of events, technical, human, environmental, link after link after link. That's why early analysis like this matters. Not to point fingers, not to criticize, but to learn. To take those questions about engines, about decision-making, about survival, and think about how we'd handle them if it ever happened to us. So, until the final report comes out, that's where this story stands. A powerful home-built bush plane, a legendary engine, a total loss of power in the worst possible place, and a rescue that shows both how fragile aviation can be and how resilience and preparation can still save lives.